When Jerry Falwell and Larry Flint went to court, the judge threw out the privacy claim and let the jury rule on the libel and infliction of emotional distress claims. Falwell asked for $5 million in compensatory damages and $10 million in punitive for his libel claim. His complaint read, The publication is false and defamatory and that it was meant by defendants and is intended to mean and was and is understood by readers of Hustler magazine as meaning that plaintiff commits illegal, immoral, and reprehensible acts, that he is an alcoholic, and that he is insincere and hypocritical in his work as a fundamentalist minister. Now, if any of these were actually concrete assertions of fact, they would be defamatory. Being accused of being an alcoholic, definitely defamatory. Being accused of illegal, immoral, and reprehensible acts, such as incest, also defamatory. But of course, no one would have believed this parody ad was actually asserting these things. So the jury found that the ad parody couldn't have been reasonably understood as describing actual facts about plaintiff or actual events in which plaintiff participated. Now, on the off chance that this wording sounds kind of familiar, it may be because John Oliver referenced this same standard when explaining that he could make jokes about the little coal goblin, Bob Murray. That wording came in part from this case. Murray listed what he found objectionable in our piece, including that we described him as someone who looks like a geriatric Dr. <laughs> Evil, which we did, and he does. And, and also that we arranged for a staff member to dress up in a squirrel costume and deliver the message, eat shit, Bob. But you know what? I will stand behind our first piece and I'll stand behind this one. And, and as for the jokes that we made about him, we are more than covered there. The judge in our case pointed out that the Supreme Court has consistently protected loose, figurative language that cannot reasonably be understood to convey facts about someone. <laughs> Basically, jokes are fine. Falwell also asked for $5 million in compensatory damages and $10 million in punitive damages for his invasion of privacy claim. Now, what was that claim? Invasion of privacy is kind of an umbrella term that we use for all of the four privacy torts. Well, his complaint said, defendants have knowingly and without plaintiff's consent used in their business and for purposes of advertisement or trade the name and photograph of plaintiff, a living person. Plaintiff's photograph and name have been prominently and wrongfully exhibited on the inside front cover of the November 1983 issue of Hustler magazine in violation of Virginia Code section 80140. Can you figure it out? We are clearly looking at an example of misappropriation or appropriation. The jury threw that out as well. For this claim, the judge said that Falwell failed to make out a prima facie case under the statute. In other words, he failed to actually make any kind of coherent argument about why this was misappropriation. And if we look at it, it's just common sense to see that the ad parody was not a commercial use. It wasn't selling anything. It was used simply to make commentary on a public figure. It wasn't for profit. And this left the intentional infliction of emotional distress tort. Now, just to give you some context about this really vague tort, you are supposed to have outrageous conduct that purposely and successfully creates severe mental, emotional distress in someone else. Now, normally, this tort finds itself in cases involving sexual assault or abuse, DUIs that cause death or injury, assault and battery causing great bodily injury, knowingly manufacturing and distributing an extremely dangerous product, retaliation against a whistleblower, or excessive use of force. And I'm guessing that one's used to sue law enforcement. So as you can see, this use of intentional infliction of emotional distress doesn't really seem to fit the pattern of what it's normally for. But in fact, at the time, there were already several cases that had gone at least up to circuit level courts that included these same three torts together, libel, misappropriation, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. So when the Fourth Circuit got this, it actually noted that this had become a trend and that public figures who were being lambasted in magazines like Hustler or National Lampoon were using these three torts to get back at publishers. 
Once again, Fall will ask for $5 million in compensatory damages and $10 million in punitive damages. His complaint read that references to plaintiff and use of his name and photograph on the inside front cover of the November 1983 issue of Hustler magazine, accusing plaintiff of illegal, immoral, and reprehensible acts, considered together in the context of the other textual materials, photographs, and cartoons containing in said magazine, caused plaintiff severe emotional anguish and distress. For Reverend Falwell to function in his livelihood and in his commitment and career, he has to have an integrity which people believe in. Did you not appreciate that? Yeah. And was it one of your objectives to destroy that integrity or harm it if you could? To assassinate it. The jury did award Reverend Falwell $250,000 for infliction of emotional distress. Both parties appealed the decision. The jury had decided in the case there was no libel, but they still wanted to award Jerry Farwell a quarter of a million dollars because I hurt his feeling, because I said his first piece was his mother. While few mainstream news organizations support Larry Flint's apparent desire to be offensive, many, including the three major television networks, have filed papers with the court supporting his legal position in this case fearing a ruling in Falwell's favor might undermine those journalists whose jobs depend on the effective use of satire. It's magazines like Hustler that need protection of the First Amendment, not the Washington Post. We offend a lot more people than the Washington Post do. But I think that the First Amendment gives me the right to be offensive, and that's what the issue is here. Mr. Flint, you acknowledged, in effect, that your ad was offensive. You say that offensiveness is covered under the First Amendment. You intended it to be offensive, right? Uh, he said he did. The he said he wished the, to assa the assassinate the character in court. Shut up. Well, the satire that we deal with is offensive 90% of the time. And we do these parodies and satires, dozens of them, every month. And we very seldom get a suit involving them. God versus the devil, America's minister versus America's pimp. Today is the showdown. Many were surprised by the high court's decision to hear Larry Flynn's case, but he had some unlikely supporters filing briefs on his behalf, like the New York Times, the American Newspaper Publishers Association, and the Association of American Editorial... All right. The Honorable, the Chief Justice, and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oye, oye, oye. All persons having business before the Honorable of the Supreme Court of the United States are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for this court is now sitting. God save the United States and the Supreme Court. We'll hear the argument first this morning in number 86-1278, Hustler Magazine and Larry C. Flint versus Jerry Falwell. Mr. Isaacman, you may proceed whenever you're ready. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. One of the most cherished ideas that we hold in this country is that there should be uninhibited public debate and freedom of speech. Now, the question you have before you today is whether a public figure's right to protection from emotional distress should outweigh the public interest in allowing every citizen of this country to freely express his views. Uh, but what was the view expressed in Exhibit A? Well, uh, to begin with, this is uh, a parody of a known Campari ad. I understand. Go ahead. Okay. Also, and more importantly, it was a satire of a public figure, of Jerry Falwell, who in this case was really a, a prime candidate for such a satire uh, because he's such an unlikely person to appear in a liquor ad. This, this is a person that we are used to seeing at the pulpit, Bible in hand, preaching with a, a famously beatific smile on his face. But what is the public interest you're describing? That there is some interest in making him look ludicrous? Yes, yes, Your Honor. There is a public interest in making Jerry Falwell look ludicrous, insofar as there is a public interest in having Hustler magazine e express the point of view that Jerry Falwell is full of BS. 
Uh, and, and Hustler Magazine has every right to express this view. Uh, they have the right to say that uh, somebody who has campaigned actively against our magazine, who has told people not to buy it, who has uh, publicly said that it, it poisons the minds of Americans, uh, who in addition has, has told people that sex out of wedlock is, is uh, immoral, uh, that they shouldn't drink, Hustler Magazine has a, a First Amendment right to publicly respond to these comments uh, by saying that Jerry Falwell is full of BS. It, it says, let's deflate this stuff, shirt, and bring him down to our level. Our level, in this case, being admittedly a lower level than most people <laughs> would like to be brought to. Uh, I, I apologize. I know I'm not supposed to joke, but that's sort of the point. But Mr. Isaacman, the First Amendment is not everything. I mean, it's a, a, a very important value, but it's not the only value in our society. What about another value which says that good people should be able to enter public life and public service? The rule you give us says that if you stand for public office or become a public figure in any way, you cannot protect yourself or indeed your mother against a parody of your committing incest with her in an outhouse. Now, do you think that uh, George Washington would have stood for public office if that was the consequence. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned George Washington, Justice Scalia, because very recently I saw a, a political cartoon that's over 200 years old. Um, it depicts George Washington riding on a donkey, being led by a man, and the caption, the caption suggests that this man is leading an ass to Washington. I can handle that. I, I think George can handle that. <laughs> but that's a far cry from committing incest with your mother in an outhouse. <laughs> I mean, there's no line between the two? There were editorial cartoons, I don't know. Uh, anybody that does, you know, satire uh, of any depth, uh, you know, they, they would really be out there without a lifeline. Uh, no, Justice Scalia, I would say there is no line between the two because really what you're talking about is a matter of taste and not law. Uh, as, as you yourself said, I believe, in Pope versus Illinois, uh, it's useless to argue about taste and even more useless to litigate it. And that is the case here. Uh, the jury has already determined for us that this is, is a matter of taste and not a matter of law because th they've said that there is no libelous speech, that nobody could reasonably believe that Hustler was actually suggesting that Jerry Falwell had sex with his mother. So why did Hustler have him and his mother together? Hustler puts him and his mother together in, in a example of literary uh, travesty, if you will. And what public purpose does this serve? Well, it serves the same public purpose as having Gary Trudeau say that Reagan has no brain or that George Bush is a wimp. It lets us look at public figures a little bit differently. We, we have a long tradition in this country of satiric commentary. Now, if, if Jerry Falwell can sue uh, when there has been no libelous speech purely on the grounds of emotional distress, then so can other public figures. And imagine, if you will, suits against people like Gary Trudeau and Johnny Carson for what he says on The Tonight Show tonight. Obviously, when, when people criticize uh, public figures, they're going to experience emotional distress. We all know that. It, it's the easiest thing in the world to claim, and it's impossible to refute. And that's what makes it a meaningless standard. Really, all it does is allow us to punish unpopular speech. And, and this country is founded, at least in part, uh, on the firm belief that unpopular speech is absolutely vital to the health of our nation. Thank you, Mr. Isaacman. A major decision by the U.S. Supreme Court today in the so-called case of the preacher versus the pornographer, a ruling expanding the constitutional protection of parody and satire. The justices threw out a $200,000 emotional distress judgment that television preacher Jerry Falwell won from Hustler magazine publisher Larry Flint. And so, the court concluded that public figures and public officials may not recover for the tort of intentional infliction of emotional distress without showing, in addition, that the publication contained a false statement of fact which was made with actual malice, i.e. with knowledge that the statement was false or with reckless disregard as to whether or not it was true. In other words, they attached the New York Times actual malice standard to IIED and ultimately shut down this kind of lawsuit. I was sure I was toast, okay? There's no way I was going to win that case. I'm sitting in a gallery and there's 
fall on these families that are out of me. And I thought, the preacher versus the pornographer, man, I am dead. And it wound up being a unanimous decision in my favor. And Justice Rehnquist, the most conservative justice on the court, wrote the opinion. That made me feel good about America.